When you are living through the events of your life on a day-to-day -day basis, it is sometimes hard to know if you are witnessing an historic turning point in the life of a nation or just mistaking the noise of Washington politics as usual. But there can be no doubt that the undercurrents in the era of William Jefferson Clinton are unprecedented. While the U.S. press barked and howled with pitiful irrelevance about Clinton's $200 haircut, he quietly became the first president in the nation's history to fire every U.S. attorney in the country. When he fired William Sessions in July 1993, it was also the first time in American history that a president had summarily dismissed an FBI director. As Americans, we must then ask what the reasons were for these unprecedented moves by a new president. Was it by design? If so, why? There are dozens of other questions that beg an answer as well. Bill Clinton himself may have given us a clue to the answer when he stated, I believe the measure of a person's values can best be measured by examining the life the person lives. That's what this documentary will attempt to do. During the 1960s, students were protesting the Vietnam War on college campuses throughout the nation. It was no different at the University of Arkansas. Here on the university campus, Clinton would climb into a tree where he would place a mattress and spend days on end to declare his own protest against the war. People in Fayetteville still recall walking a block out of their way just to avoid the strong stench that came from the ground below Clinton. In 1969, Clinton was called to London for a physical examination and was classified 1A, which meant Vietnam. Upon his return to Arkansas, Clinton drove to Fayetteville to the home of Colonel Eugene Holmes, commander of the Army ROTC unit at the University of Arkansas, where he begged to join the program. Clinton signed a letter of intent and gave a pledge to enter the university law school. In the fall, he returned to Oxford where he would help organize demonstrations against the United States outside the American Embassy. On December 2, 1969, in violation of his promise to enroll in the ROTC program, he applied to Yale Law School. On December 3rd, he wrote a letter to Colonel Holmes stating, quote, Because of my opposition to the draft and the war, I have great sympathy with those who are not willing to fight, kill, and maybe die for their country, unquote. Mr. Clinton was described as a moocher and with no apparent income. Yet he left England for a 40-day trip to Scandinavia, the Soviet Union, and Czechoslovakia. Clinton stayed at one of Moscow's most exclusive hotels, the National. Clinton went on to Prague, where he stayed with Oxford friend John Kopold's parents, who were leaders in the Communist Party. The grandfather was a founder of the Czech Communist Party and a member of the party's central committee. In fact, Communist Czechoslovakia had been a training area for international terrorists. Shortly after Clinton's return to America, his friend Jan Kapold died mysteriously when he fell from the upper floors of a derelict building in circumstances that were unclear. Another close Clinton friend and a fellow draft dodger at Oxford was Frank Aller. When he returned to Spokane, Washington, he was found shot to death in September 1971. His death was ruled a suicide. At Yale Law School in 1970, Hillary Rodham helped found the Yale Review of Law and Social Action. The second issue devoted 50 pages to the murder trial of Black Panther Lonnie McLucas. Some of the illustrations depict policemen as pigs. One drawing shows a decapitated and dismembered pig squealing in agony. And another one described them as, quote, a low-natured beast that has no regard for law, justice, or the rights of people. A creature that bites the hand that feeds it. A foul, depraved traducer 
usually found masquerading as the victim of an unprovoked attack, unquote. Other articles encouraged experimentation with drugs, sex, and individual lifestyles. In Bill Clinton's Arkansas, some two million people remained among the poorest in the nation. Their average yearly income was less than the $20,000 annual fees at the Little Rock Country Club. Arkansas families earning less than $9,000 a year paid nearly four times more state tax proportionately than families making in excess of $600,000. Arkansas remained almost last in the United States in per capita expenditure for education in the percentage of its students completing high school and the proportion of its citizens with college degrees. Nowhere in America is the range so great as in Arkansas, wrote the Arkansas Times in 1992, from the multi-billionaire status of the Walmart Waltons to the abject poverty of the Delta region where Lee County is listed as one of the ten poorest counties in the entire nation. Infant mortality there is twice the national average and two-thirds of all children never graduate from high school. In the aftermath of his 1980 election defeat, Bill Clinton began appearing every Sunday at Emanuel Baptist Church, which he had never attended so regularly before. He was now seen prominently in the choir, as carefully arranged television cameras carried the service to thousands of viewers throughout the state. A convicted drug dealer and informant named Charlene Wilson testified to a 1990 federal grand jury in Arkansas that she had attended parties in which she watched as Roger Clinton passed cocaine to his brother Bill. On one occasion, Clinton got so high on cocaine that he fell into a garbage can. She also testified that the people would share sex partners and some of the women included teenage girls. In 1983-84, local narcotics officers videotaped Bill Clinton's brother Roger, saying, quote, Got to get some for my brother. He's got a nose like a vacuum cleaner, unquote. Throughout the 1980s, the Clintons would enjoy relative impunity from the scrutiny of investigative journalism. The rare independent journalist was soon made an example. Publisher Gene Wurgis tried to expose ballot box stuffing and other corruption through the 1960s and 1970s and was lucky to survive nearly a dozen attempts on his life. He was indicted seven times on trumped up charges ranging from slander to conspiracy and was once sentenced to three years at hard labor only to be saved when the main prosecution witness was proven to have lied. In 1978, in Clinton's first run for governor, a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel named Bill Guerin accused Clinton of being a draft dodger by reneging on his 1969 ROTC commitment. Clinton, thinking his letter to Colonel Holmes had long since been destroyed, insisted that the ROTC agreement was canceled shortly after it was made. He said he told Colonel Holmes that he would enter the ROTC program if the commander wanted him to, but he preferred to take his chances with the draft. However, the colonel would tell a different story. In September 1992, Colonel Eugene Holmes, himself a lifelong Democrat, made a final statement on the episode and presented Clinton's letter to the press. He stated that Clinton, quote, purposely deceived me using the possibility of joining the ROTC as a ploy, purposely defrauding the military, both in concealing his anti-military activities overseas and his counterfeit intentions for later military service." Unquote. It was in this setting that Bill Clinton entered state politics in 1975. When he left in 1991, he had been governor for 12 years. What he had done in and for Arkansas, he claimed, qualified him to govern the nation. From Clinton's first years as Attorney General, 
Little Rock had been awash in gossip about his blatant womanizing. After he was elected president, Arkansas trooper bodyguards and others would testify to his extramarital relations with literally hundreds of women. State trooper L.D. Brown stated that on state time and using state cars, he drove the governor to over 100 extramarital affairs and guarded him during those encounters. Brown was Clinton's favorite trooper, and he received dozens of books from the governor, many of which he still retains. In one law book, there's a sentence to the effect that adultery is not a crime and is underlined twice in red. Larry Patterson was an Arkansas state trooper for 31 years and a personal bodyguard for then Governor Clinton for six years. More than once, Patterson said, he stood guard and witnessed the department store clerk performing oral sex on Governor Clinton in a parked car, including the parking lot of Chelsea's elementary school and on the grounds of the governor's mansion. It was probably the most bizarre time I've spent in my tenure with, with the state police. I was required to, to go out into the audiences to get women's telephone numbers, their names for him, to block streets, to sit in women's driveways till the wee hours of three and four, five o'clock in the morning uh, at their apartment complexes. Uh, that's what I was required to do. That was just part of the job. I was told when I protested about that that uh, if I didn't like it, I'd find another job. Did you feel soiled? Did you feel uh, in any way um, disdain for this man that you were assigned to risk, quite frankly, your life for? But your job did not uh, turn out to be saving his life or protecting him. Uh, you, quite frankly, uh, turned out to be someone assigned to procure. It's a pimp. I didn't want to use that word, but how did, how did that make you feel? Well, you know, it was real easy to, you know, to get caught up in all the hoopla at first. But after a while, after you saw the way he treated people, you know, that's not the, the way that I was taught. It was not the standards that, that I was raised by. And it, it, it bothered me a lot. And, and to the point where I talked to my supervisors about it, I talked to the director of the state police about it. And I was told, yeah, that's part of your job. In fact, Bill Clinton told me one time, he said, Larry, you may be required to lie, to steal, to kill, to protect me, to cover me. Was his words. On yet another occasion, the governor arrived at the Little Rock Airport. Clinton told his bodyguards that he was going to be driven back to the residence by the Arkansas lawyer who had met the plane so that she could show him her new Jaguar. On the ride back, he drove and she was nowhere to be seen in the car. He later told Trooper Patterson that he had researched the subject in the Bible and oral sex isn't considered adultery. George Grieg of the London Sunday Times wrote, quote, what has emerged is a man with what would appear to be an almost psychotic inability to control his zipper." Unquote. The repeated testimony of state troopers would show that Clinton rated women as objects, ripe peaches as he called them, purely to be graded, chased, dominated, and conquered. The governor had been predatory even toward one of the troopers' wives and toward another's mother-in-law. Neither then nor later did many of those around Clinton reflect on the deeper meaning of the womanizing and what it said about other aspects of the man and leader. No fewer than four Arkansas State Troopers, including two past presidents of the Arkansas State Troopers Association, have now provided detailed accounts of attempts to silence them because of their knowledge about Clinton's affairs with unmerited career promotions and job offers. Federal jobs was offered by Bill Clinton when Roger Perry and Danny Ferguson and Ronnie Anderson and I first came forward. If we would uh, keep quiet, not say anything, that we could have U.S. Marshals jobs, that we could have FEMA director's jobs, if we would just keep our mouth shut. As Bill Clinton's presidential campaign got underway, some of the troopers were considering coming forward. 
the commander of Clinton's security detail, then threatened Roger Perry and other troopers on behalf of the President of the United States. He said the troopers' reputations would be destroyed and that they themselves would be destroyed. Larry Patterson even received a handwritten note expressing concern about his health. Larry, did you um, fear Bill Clinton? Personally, no, I, I did not. Uh, after, you know, after I got to know the man, you know, if it came to a confrontation between a, a policeman and Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton would always back down. No, I was not physically afraid of Bill Clinton. I was afraid of his power. Larry, were you afraid of Bill Clinton's friends? You betcha. You betcha. He had some uh, some uh, people that uh, that was quite scary, yes. Away from the public spotlight, both Bill and, to a greater extent, Hillary, were contemptuous of policemen, whom they commonly derided as ignorant SOBs, says Trooper Brown. In 1984, Brown accompanied Clinton to a funeral for a state trooper who had been killed by a survivalist in rural Dequeen. Brown and Clinton went into a banquet room, where hundreds of mourning policemen from Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana were eating. According to Brown, Clinton said, quote, I don't want to go in and eat with those ignorant SOBs. Let's go to another room, unquote. Hillary was openly hostile, calling them pigs. One trooper said that Hillary forbade him to speak when he accompanied her on a trip to Washington because, as she put it, he, quote, sounded like a hick from Arkansas, unquote. Another officer said, quote, deep down that woman really hated Arkansas, the people in it, and almost everything else except being top dog, unquote. Troopers volunteered to work several days of consecutive 16-hour shifts just to avoid traveling with her. After becoming president, her attitude remained the same. A Secret Service agent was quoted as saying it was obvious that she had a clear dislike for the agents, bordering on hatred, in his opinion. On another occasion, Secret Service agents heard Hillary's daughter Chelsea refer to them as personal trained pigs to some of her friends. One of the agents explained to her that he was willing to put his life on the line to save hers. And he believed that her father, the president, would be shocked if he heard what she just said to her friends. Chelsea's response was, I don't think so. That's what my parents call you. As soon as Clinton was elected governor, he and Hillary formed a partnership with Jim and Susan McDougall in the Whitewater land deal. The McDougals would manage the business and bear most of the risk and liability, while Bill and Hillary would still enjoy a full 50% ownership. In 1979, the Clintons donated a small parcel of land near a river that flowed through Whitewater Estates to the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. The donation was contingent upon construction of a boat ramp. Once the ramp was completed, a paved access road, funded at taxpayers' expense, was built from Highway 101 to the ramp, adding substantially to the overall value and marketability of home sites. Bill Clinton had used the powers of his office to enhance the value of his real estate speculation. Many elderly buyers invested in Whitewater, because, after all, it was owned by the governor and his wife. However, they made the mistake of not reading the fine print of the real estate contract. As many of them would find, if they defaulted on their monthly installments for more than 30 days, they would lose all of their equity in the land, regardless of how much they had put down or paid in. The results could be devastating. Clyde Soaps put $3,000 down and faithfully made 35 monthly payments of two hundred forty four dollars and sixty nine cents when he fell desperately ill he could no longer make his payments although he had paid twelve thousand dollars of the fourteen thousand dollar price of the lot he quickly lost the land and all his previous investment this was a typical case more than half of those who bought whitewater lots would lose their land and all their equity payments Records showed at least 16 different buyers paying in more than $50,000 and 
and never receiving property deeds. Meanwhile, Whitewater carried on a flourishing traffic in repossessions and resales, selling some lots over and over when elderly buyers faltered on their payments. A local businessman said, quote, They screwed people left and right, taking advantage of a bunch of poor old folks on a land deal, the future president and first lady. That ought to be the real Whitewater scandal, unquote. Real estate development was not the Clintons' only good fortune. Less than two months after launching Whitewater, Hillary Rodham began trading in the cattle futures market. She was allowed to open her account with a $1,000 deposit, rather than the $12,000 that mercantile exchange rules required. On October 11, 1978, her first transaction netted, within days, a $5,300 gain. Within a week, Hillary had won another $7,800 and $7,200 more only days after that. When she got out of the market in July 1979, her $1,000 investment had mushroomed into $100,000. Her 10,000% return on her investment was more than five times the rate of profit made by investors that had bought when she did and sold at the peak of the market during the same period. One commodities analyst said that the odds against such pre-science and mastery trading would have been about the same as those of finding the Dead Sea Scrolls on the steps of the State House in Little Rock. In 1995, economists at Auburn and North Florida universities ran a computer statistical model of the First Lady's trades for publication in the Journal of Economics and Statistics. They concluded that the probability of Hillary Rodham's having made her trades legitimately was less than one in 250 million. Her broker, Robert Bone, was eventually given a three-year suspension, one of the most severe sanctions short of criminal prosecution. A 1981 audit showed that Chelsea's nanny, Desi Sanders, was employed at the governor's mansion from the time of Chelsea's birth to the time Clinton left office. The state of Arkansas does not pay for nannies. So Governor Clinton had Desi Sanders listed on the payroll as a security guard. During the decade of the 1980s, the Clintons' income would put them in the top 3% of American families. Despite this, the Clintons would take nearly $200,000 off their taxes in charitable contributions. Yearly totals range from about $1,000 to well over $2,300. $30 for three shower curtains, $40 for an old pair of Bill's running shoes, and various amounts were discarded undershorts and shirts. The 1980s would prove to be very profitable for the Clintons. Ironically, during her husband's run for the presidency, Hillary would accuse the 1980s as being the decade of greed. The Arkansas Development Finance Authority, or ADFA, was set up by Governor Clinton to ease financing for low-income housing and small businesses. The agency's expensive legal work went to favored law firms, its lucrative underwriting to select Wall Street houses and local bond brokers, almost all of them backing Bill Clinton. There was virtually no legislative oversight or public accountability. Governor Clinton himself appointed the ADFA board, and personally approved every bond issue and major transaction from 1985 through 1992. In 1985 alone, ADFA issued bonds for more than $700 million. His 1990 campaign received over $400,000 in contributions from those benefiting directly from the publicly guaranteed bonds. In the late 1980s, a nursing home chain called Beverly Enterprises was in financial trouble. A Texas banker and Hillary's employer, the Rose Law Firm, formed a non-profit corporation to buy the nursing homes. They would make millions in profits while being financed by tax-exempt state bonds. In September 1989, they were about to carry off a deal in Arkansas for the purchase of 32 nursing homes with $83 million in state bonds. At the last moment, the deal collapsed when Attorney General Steve Clark claimed 
he had been offered $100,000 in campaign money as a bribe to drop his opposition to the Beverly Bonds. The partner who devised the nursing home scheme, William Kennedy III, would later be named a counsel to the president, one of the most powerful positions in the Clinton White House. Dan Lassiter was an Arkansas bond dealer and a close friend, as well as a major contributor to then Governor Clinton. Clinton awarded Lassiter a $30 million bond to install a new police radio system for the Arkansas State Police. During this very period, Lassiter was under investigation by the Arkansas police for cocaine trafficking. Intelligence reports show that the Drug Enforcement Agency had opened a file on Lassiter in 1983. The Attorney General's office in Santa Fe, New Mexico, investigated Lassiter for narcotics trafficking with possible ties to organized crime. A federal grand jury indicted Dan Lassiter and accused him of conspiring with Bill Clinton's brother, Roger Clinton, and others to knowingly and willfully possess with the intent to distribute and to distribute cocaine. In the end, Lassiter was offered a plea agreement and was charged with conspiracy to distribute cocaine. He was paroled after one year, most of it spent in a halfway house. He was granted a full pardon by then Governor Clinton. Patty Ann Smith was 16 years old when she fell under the influence of Dan Lassiter. She was still a child, but not for long. In the offices of the U.S. Attorney in Little Rock, she stated, quote, I was a virgin until two months after I met Dan Lassiter. I finally gave in and slept with him. I was introduced to cocaine use by Dan Lassiter when I was 16 years old and a student at North Little Rock High School. Dan Lassiter planned on using me as a prostitute to entertain his friends." Unquote. At the time, Lassiter was 40, more than twice her age. She was told by one of Lassiter's cohorts that, quote, if I ever betray his trust and hurt Lassiter in any way, I would not see daylight to tell about it anymore, unquote. She said she met Bill Clinton several times, but he was never acting like a governor when I saw him. She claims to have witnessed Governor Clinton taking cocaine on several occasions. In an interview with U.S. attorneys, a 33-year-old Little Rock woman stated that she had been started on cocaine by an associate of Lassiter's. He warned her that she was as good as dead if she ever told anything about him or Lassiter. As a circuit court clerk, Dennis Patrick's income was less than $25,000. Dan Lassiter's brokerage company would secretly run over $100 million through Dennis's account. When the FBI found out, they informed Dennis that he would be an important witness in their investigation of Whitewater. The ATF soon learned that Dennis's life was in danger and informed him that a contract was out on his life. It was then that he began wearing a bulletproof vest. After two attempts on his life, the police arrested a man who admitted that he had been contracted for $20,000 to kill Dennis Patrick and his wife. Patsy Thomason was given power of attorney to manage Lassiter's business empire while he was in prison. An employee at Lassiter's firm told Dennis that Thomason was in charge and that she could put an end to his nightmare. But the nightmare continued and Dennis was stripped of his life his name, his integrity, everything he had. He eventually fled the state for his safety as well as that of his family. Patsy Thomason was clearly a favorite of Bill Clinton. He appointed her executive secretary of the Arkansas Democratic Party, which helped build the foundations for his presidential bid. After the 1992 elections, she was given one of the most powerful positions in Washington, director of the White House Office of Administration. In this position, Thomason failed to provide proper security clearances for over 100 White House staff members, many of whom were alleged drug users. Under her direction, random drug testing for the White House staff was eliminated. Poultry tycoon Don Tyson heavily financed Bill Clinton's election campaigns throughout his career. In return, he received millions of dollars in state tax breaks 
as well as favorable treatment in the form of relaxed environmental regulations. Under Clinton, the chicken industry effectively made its own rules in Arkansas. Hillary's amazing $100,000 profit from an initial $1,000 investment was made possible through the influence of Tyson Foods counselor James Blair. After this incident, the relationship between the Clintons and Tyson Foods president Don Tyson came under examination. The resulting revelations were shocking indeed, as evidenced by the following documents from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, which linked Don Tyson to drug trafficking. One file cited an informant who said Tyson was involved in drug traffic and stolen property. Another stated that Tyson's company aircraft was being utilized to smuggle drugs from Florida to Springdale, Arkansas. A memorandum on July 19, 1988 is centered on Don Tyson's illegal use and distribution of cocaine. It calls for a combined investigation team of FBI, DEA, IRS, and the state police. There were documents that referred to alleged hitmen employed by Tyson to kill drug dealers who owed him money. In one of them, an informer stated that Daddy Don, Donald Tyson, can put out the word to take care of you. She gave as an example a female who was found in a culvert near Highway 71 outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas. One woman stated that she was afraid that she might get killed as she understood that Don Tyson was a drug dealer who brought drugs in from California by truck and airplanes. And a confidential informant claimed to have information on an alleged hitman for Don Tyson. None of the allegations against Don Tyson have led to criminal charges. Police officers who tried to mount a case against Tyson were destroyed by their superiors in the state police. Mena, Arkansas is tucked away in the remote Washita Mountains of western Arkansas. It became the site of one of the most enduring conspiracy theories of the late 20th century. The core allegation is that the airport was used to transport weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras with collusion and cover-up implicating Governor Bill Clinton. It was a multi-billion dollar gun running, drug smuggling and money laundering operation. Barry Steele was a legend in the cocaine trade. His drug runs were flown in from Latin America, loads averaging 300 pounds of cocaine and worth at least tens of millions of dollars, and parachuted onto remote sites in Arkansas. By the sheer magnitude of the drugs and money its flights generated, tiny Mena, Arkansas became in the 1980s one of the world centers of the narcotics trade and the base of what many believed was the single largest cocaine smuggling operation in U.S. history. Larry Douglas Brown was Bill Clinton's favorite among the troopers assigned as his personal bodyguards. Brown gave hundreds of pages of testimony under oath and supporting documentation that the governor had clearly been aware of the arms and drug running out of Mena as early as 1984. The state trooper watched in despair while the governor did nothing about it. In October of 1984, Barry Seal and Brown had lunch at Cajun's Wharf in Little Rock, a popular restaurant in the Arkansas River Bottoms. In conversations over the next few weeks, Seal casually referred to Clinton as the Gov and acted like he knew the governor, Brown recalled. By the summer of 1985, Seal became a scapegoat and was sentenced to a halfway house in Baton Rouge. It was there that assassins found him and gunned him down in his white Cadillac on a rainy February night in 1986. IRS agent Bill Duncan and state police detective Russell Welch had compiled a mammoth investigative file on the Mina operation. The material became part of an eventual 35-volume, 3,000-page Arkansas State Police archive, a meticulous presentation of the Mina case for a grand jury. However, the cases were effectively suppressed. Duncan and Welts were not even called to testify before grand juries, state or federal. Duncan and Welch watched the MENA inquiry systematically quashed and their own careers destroyed as the IRS and state police effectively disavowed their investigations.
On the night of August 23rd, 1987, just outside the little town of Alexander, Arkansas, Kevin Ives, 17, and Don Henry, 16, witnessed a cocaine drop, which was part of the drug smuggling operation in Mena, Arkansas. The boys were captured and their hands were tied behind their backs. They were kicked and beaten and finally executed. One of the boys was stabbed to death. The bodies were wrapped in a tarpaulin and placed across the railway tracks to be mangled by the next train. The Arkansas medical examiner, Fami Malik, ruled the deaths an accident. He said the boys had smoked marijuana joints and had fallen into a trance on the railway tracks side by side. As the facts would later show, the crime lab never tested the concentration of marijuana in their blood. They were told to back Malik's ruling. Bill Clinton was the only person to whom the crime lab answered. Kevin Ives' mother, Linda, created such a stir that a grand jury was called to investigate the case. The bodies were exhumed, and a second autopsy was conducted by the Atlanta medical examiner, Dr. Joseph Burton. He showed an enhanced photograph of the wound to six other forensic investigators. They all concurred that it was a stab wound. He also found that Kevin Ives had been smashed in the head with a rifle butt. The report of the grand jury concluded that the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives were definitely the result of foul play. It urged that law enforcement agencies, the prosecuting attorney's office, to continue the investigation into the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives and into the drug problem in Saline County. Because of Linda Ives' investigation into the death of her son, she was placed on Bill Clinton's enemy list by White House counsel Mark Fabian. Already, people associated with the case were beginning to die in what amounted to a reign of terror among young people in Alexander, Arkansas. April 1988, Keith Coney told his mother he knew too much about the Ives Henry murders and feared for his life. After being slashed in the neck, he was fleeing for his life on his motorcycle when he slammed into the back of a truck and was killed. Booney Bearden, a friend of the boys, disappeared. His body was never found. November 1988, Keith McCaskill claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. McCaskill, knowing that his life was in danger, had said goodbye to his friends and family. He died from 113 stab wounds. January 1989, Gregory Collins claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. Collins was found dead from a shotgun blast to the face. April 1989, Jeff Rhodes claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. His body was found in the city dump, dead of a gunshot wound to the head. July 1989, Richard Winters claimed to have knowledge of the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. Winters was silenced by a blast from a sawed off shotgun. June 1990, Jordan Kettleson claimed to have information on the Ives Henry murders, but was killed before he could testify. He died from a shotgun blast to the head. To date, no arrests have been made in regard to these murders. Arkansas's medical examiner ruled the death of two teenage boys an accident, while several forensic investigators and a grand jury concluded they were murdered. But this was not the first nor the last time that Fami Malik's rulings would cause controversy. In 1985, a North Arkansas man was fatally shot, and Fami Malik ruled it a suicide. There were four gunshot wounds to the chest. In the 1986 case, Malik's ruling was accidental drowning. It was later discovered that the victim had been shot in the head. In 1992, a man's body was found with five bullet wounds, but Malik nevertheless ruled it a suicide. In his most incredible ruling, Malik concluded that a James Milam had died of an ulcer. However, the man's skull was later recovered. He had been decapitated with a sharp knife. That Malik survived in Arkansas is a testament to Clinton's power. Just before Clinton announced his intentions to run for president, Malik was moved to another state job.
Union boss Arthur Coya has managed to build a political alliance with the Clinton administration. He attended the White House regularly to share breakfast with the First Lady and flew with Clinton on Air Force One. Even as Coya and the President gave each other gifts, such as expensive golf clubs, the Justice Department was filing a civil suit against Coya. It charged that he and his co-conspirators employed actual and threatened force, violence and fear of physical and economic injury to create a climate of intimidation and fear. Members were intimidated into silence by violence, economic coercion and by the known ties of local and international union officials with organized crime. Within days after a draft of the suit was delivered to Coya, President Clinton sent him two personal letters. One thanked Coya for his support of Democratic candidates, and another promised to share Coya's views on labor with Labor Secretary Robert Reich. Mr. Free, over 65 people have invoked the Fifth Amendment or fled the country in the course of the committee's investigation. Have you ever experienced so many unavailable witnesses in any matter in which you've prosecuted or in which you've been involved? Um, actually, I have. You have? Um, give, me a, give me a rundown on that real quickly. I spent about um, 16 years doing organized crime cases in New York City, and many people were frequently unavailable. So the, was that the only time you experienced something like that? Went on for quite a while. So the only time <laughs> that you experienced anything like this was when you were investigating an organized crime syndicate. On Monday, July 19, 1993, President Clinton called FBI Director William Sessions to tell him that he was dismissed. It would be the first time in our nation's history that a president had fired an FBI director. He called a second time a few minutes later. The president seemed to be in a hurry. Time was of the essence. Sessions was to leave the Hoover building effective immediately. The next day, Vince Foster's body was found in Fort Marcy Park, dead from a gunshot wound to the head. Under the assassination statute, the FBI would have been compelled by law to take over the case if there was any question that it might have been a homicide. But with the firing of its director, the FBI was in turmoil, and the Park Police became the lead agency in charge. The Park Service had neither the depth nor the experience to investigate a case of this magnitude, which led many to ponder the question, was it the intention of the White House to limit the scope of the investigation? Vince Foster had been a close friend of Bill Clinton's in their boyhood town of Hope, Arkansas. As Deputy White House Counsel for the Clinton Administration, Foster became the highest ranking U.S. government official to die under mysterious circumstances since President John F. Kennedy. He, more than anyone else, knew the financial secrets of both the campaign of 1992 and the Clinton presidency, just as he knew the secrets of the Rose Law Firm and of Hillary Rodham Clinton's business and financial dealings over the previous decade. Dealings that would become the subject of numerous investigations. On July 22nd, Foster's briefcase was searched twice by Bernard Nussbaum in the presence of Justice Department officials and the U.S. Park Police. Four days later, a suicide note mysteriously appeared in the briefcase. It was torn into 28 pieces with one piece missing. No fingerprints were found on the note, only a partial palm print of Nussbaum's. Distinguished handwriting experts were contacted, the most famous being Dr. Reginald Alton of Oxford University in England. The note, he said, was a fake. It was the work of a forger. Associate Independent Counsel Mikel Rodriguez was not a conservative. Indeed, when he arrived from California with his ponytail, his earring, and his leather jacket, there were some that said Kenneth Starr had gone too far in his efforts to recruit liberal Democrats and ethnic minorities to his team. Rodriguez spent his time combing through the archive of documents in the Foster case, and he didn't like what he saw. He managed to gain access to the locked files in the office of the independent counsel. Hidden inside was a folder of crime scene photographs that had been deliberately withheld from the prosecutor. 
Among them was the original Polaroid of Foster's neck. Rodriguez went to the Smithsonian Institution for enhancement of the original. The blow-up photo revealed a dime-sized wound on the right side of Foster's neck, suggesting a gunshot fired at point-blank range into the flesh. The medical examiner at the scene was Dr. Howard. After examining Foster's body, he made reference to a wound on Foster's neck on page two of his report. This finding was in agreement with two of the rescue workers who testified before the Whitewater Grand Jury that they too saw a gunshot wound on Foster's neck. Incredibly, in the official autopsy report on Vincent Foster, a gunshot wound to the head is listed, but the wound on the neck is completely left out. The official autopsy conducted by Dr. Beyer states that there was a large one by one and a quarter inch exit wound found on Foster's head. Both Fisk and Starr in their final reports similarly maintain that there was an exit wound on Foster's head. However, this is in direct conflict with those who examined the body at the scene. A 38 special will take the back of your head off, blood and brain matter everywhere, yet no skull fragments or brain matter were found by the FBI or Park Police. Two days after Vincent Foster's body was discovered in Fort Marcy Park, an FBI memo was sent to then acting director Floyd Clark. It says in part, quote, Preliminary results of the autopsy include the finding that a 38 caliber revolver constructed from two different weapons was fired into the victim's mouth with no exit wound, unquote. This was in agreement with Detective John Rollo, who examined Foster's body at the scene. He agreed that there was no exit wound, and in fact, stated that he thought the bullet might still be lodged in Foster's head. Paramedics Corey Ashford and Roger Harrison put the body in a bag for transport to the morgue, yet neither of them saw an exit wound or any blood, either on the body or on the ground beneath the body. This was in agreement with Dr. Howe, who examined the body at the scene and wrote in his report that the wound was mouth to neck. Paramedic Todd Hall was one of the first to arrive. He testified before the grand jury that he saw two men running away from the scene into the woods. Paramedic Richard Arthur, who had attended to 25 to 30 gunshot deaths in his nine years as a rescue worker, believed it was a homicide. I've just never seen a body lying so perfectly straight, he said. His colleague, Corey Ashford, also had coded the death as a homicide. For four months, Rodriguez probed the case. He called witnesses before a grand jury and soon discovered serious indications of a cover-up. By the early spring of 1995, he was starting to probe a hypothesis that the crime scene at Fort Marcy Park had been staged, that the gun had most likely been planted in Foster's hand, and that a crucial photograph of Foster's neck and head had been falsified. He turned to his boss, Kenneth Starr, for support. Nothing was done to resolve the matter. In March 1995, Rodriguez resigned. The only serious investigation ever conducted into the death of Vincent Foster came to an abrupt end. The confidential witness had stopped at Fort Marcy Park and had ventured about 700 feet into the wooded groves where he spotted a body lying in the dense foliage. He looked as if he'd been dead for a long time. I mean hours, he said. The bed of dried leaves below the body had been very heavily trampled and his hands were neatly next to his body with the palms up. He said under oath to a congressional delegation that he saw no weapon, no gun, there was nothing in Foster's hands. A Park Police Polaroid shows a 38 Colt revolver hooked on Foster's thumb. It was made from parts of at least two separate weapons, and it had two different serial numbers. The only recorded sale to gun retailers of both serial numbers was in 1913, and that was too old to trace. Foster's fingerprints were not found on the gun, although a print belonging to someone else was found under one of the detachable grips. A 38 Special has a fierce recoil, 
and can throw one's hand back over their head. However, the large sight on the gun did not damage Foster's teeth or gum tissue, and the gun was neatly at his side. Residents of homes as close as 300 yards away were never interviewed by the park police as to whether they had heard a gunshot. The bullet was never found. No matching ammunition was found in Foster's house. Also, note the heavy foliage around the body, which is inconsistent with the dirt pathway in front of the second cannon where the police claim the body was found. Foster would have had to walk 700 feet into the park, yet the FBI lab tests found no coherent soil on Foster's shoes. Investigators doing simulation walks found an abundance of soil on their shoes. Two homicide detectives who performed their own two-month investigation into the Foster case concluded that the crime scene had likely been staged, with the gun placed in Foster's hand to make it look like a suicide. This report, funded by the Western Journalism Center in California, was prepared by Vincent Scalise and Fred Santucci, both veteran homicide experts from the New York City Police Department. Two witnesses, Mark and Judy, were interviewed by the FBI in April 1994. They drove a white Nissan into the parking lot at Fort Marcy Park. Judy said she saw a man sitting in Vince Foster's Honda. Mark said that a man with long blonde hair had been standing by the open hood of Foster's car. Blonde hairs were later found on Foster's undershirt, his trousers, belt, socks, and shoes. But the FBI never tried to identify these hairs. Kenneth Starr concluded his report in July 1997 without calling these two witnesses before the grand jury. Another witness, Patrick Knowlton, stopped by Fort Marcy Park to relieve himself. He saw a car and Foster's suit jacket folded over the driver's seat. But it was not Foster's car. He also saw a threatening Hispanic man on watch in the parking lot of Fort Marcy Park. After telling the FBI what he saw, Mr. Knowlton was asked not to mention what he saw to the press. Mr. Knowlton agreed. Seventeen months later, he discovered through an investigative reporter his statements to the FBI had been changed. Knowlton's description of the unoccupied car in the lot was twisted, so it could have been Vince Foster's, even though his real statement rules out any possibility of the car being Foster's. The time he was at the park is expanded. It fails to say that Knowlton could pick the suspicious character out of a lineup. Through his attorney, Patrick Knowlton submitted a 20-page evidential insert to the three-judge panel that appointed Kenneth Starr. As he put it, to make sure that the report was full and complete. Attached was Exhibit 1, which is a map of the cars in the Fort Marcy lot. Knowlton was parked next to an older model Honda that was not Vince Foster's car. According to the official record, the best estimates put the time of Mr. Foster's death at between 2 and 4 p.m. However, Mr. Foster's body was discovered at 5.45 p.m., or approximately 70 minutes after Patrick had left the park. Mr. Foster, therefore, could not have driven to the park in his Honda. Exhibit 2 is a map depicting the harassment Patrick suffered. The day he was subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury, he was harassed by at least 25 men who would walk toward him or came at him from behind with threatening glares in their eyes. This technique is known to federal intelligence and investigative agencies, and its objects are twofold. One, to intimidate and warn witnesses in connection with his grand jury testimony. And two, to destabilize him and discredit his testimony before the grand jury. In this exhibit, Mrs. Foster could identify only a silver gun. So FBI agents apparently showed Lisa Foster a silver gun told her it was found in Mr. Foster's hand, and falsely reported that she identified the black gun found in Mr. Foster's hand as belonging to Mr. Foster. And yet another exhibit shows that the FBI concealed the gunshot wound in Mr. Foster's neck by concealing the contents of the medical examiner's report, which states that there was a gunshot wound in Mr. Foster's neck. Falsely reporting that the 35 millimeter photographs were underexposed, concealing that Polaroid photographs vanished, and concealing that autopsy x-rays had in fact been taken. 
That in the U.S. Park Police report, Dr. Byer discussed the existence of x-rays. That the technician who installed the x-ray machine said that it was in good working condition. But the Fisk report stated that the x-ray machine was inoperable at the time of Foster's autopsy. And as a result, no x-rays were taken. The sequence is crystal clear. In his notebook, Detective Rolla writes, Dead body, Fort Marcy, warm sunny day. His handwritten notes also indicate that he called the Secret Service at the White House at 6.45 p.m. Twenty minutes later at 7.05 p.m., Secret Service logs show that Patsy Thomason checked into the offices of administration where Vince Foster's office was. Foster had kept important documents on Whitewater and other matters in his safe. And a short time later, a group from the Technical Security Division was logged in with her. They were experts in locks and safes. Trooper Roger Perry was on duty at the guard shack of the Arkansas Governor's Mansion when a call came through from the White House. Trooper Larry Patterson tells the story. I had just gotten off work, had driven from State Police Headquarters to my apartment complex. Arrived home no later than 5 p.m. When I, I had, was just inside my apartment, I had not taken off my uniform. I had not gotten a Coke or a glass of water or something out of the refrigerator. I was in my apartment looking at my mail, getting ready to, to undress. The phone rang. I pick it up. It's Roger Perry. He said, Larry, you will not believe what just happened. He said, Helen Dickey just called from the White House and said that Vince Foster had just gotten off work, walked out in the parking lot, and shot himself in the head. So this was the latest, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, Washington, D.C. time. Perry relayed the message to Governor Jim Guy Tucker. He also called Lynn Davis, the former commander of the Arkansas State Police. Four men in Little Rock knew about the death of Vincent Foster before 6 p.m. Washington time, at least 15 minutes before the Park Police discovered the body in Fort Marcy Park. President Clinton appeared on Larry King Live at 9 p.m. It was being broadcast in the library of the White House. About 20 minutes before he went on the air, a CNN makeup artist was preparing the president for his television appearance when a man walked in and announced that a note had been found in Vince Foster's office. So the White House Secret Service, Chelsea's nanny, and three troopers in Arkansas had known for several hours, but Bill Clinton went on Larry King as if he knew nothing of Foster's death. At the time of Vince Foster's death, Hillary Clinton was in Los Angeles. As the LA Times reported, she cut her trip short and flew to Little Rock the day of his death. No reason was given as to the sudden change of schedule. Former FBI Director William Sessions stated that the Foster case had been compromised from the beginning. It was compromised when the White House took control of the FBI by firing Sessions the day before Foster's death. Gerald Parks was a Little Rock private investigator who became deeply enmeshed in the Clinton political machine. He later became head of security for the Clinton-Gore National Campaign headquarters in Little Rock. Later, during the early stages of the presidential campaign, Parks claimed to have made at least two trips to the airport near Mena, Arkansas. He said that Vince Foster had paid him $1,000 cash for each trip. He would pick up a trunk load of money from the Mena airport and deliver the money to Vince in the Kmart parking lot. Jerry's wife, Jane, was the manager of an apartment complex where Bill Clinton's brother Roger was living. Many times the governor would appear and indulge in marijuana and cocaine with his brother. Girls as young as 17 or 18 years of age were sometimes there to party with the Clinton brothers. When Jane told her husband about the goings-on in Roger Clinton's apartment, he began to write down names, dates, and license plates. He snapped photos from another balcony. Over a period of time, 
Parks had collected a thick dossier on the comings and goings of Bill Clinton. Jane Parks revealed that her husband had carried out sensitive assignments for the Clinton circle for almost a decade, and the person who gave him his instructions was Vince Foster. Foster had called the Parks home more than a hundred times, identifying himself with the code name The Congressman. By the late 1980s, Vince trusted Parks enough to ask him to perform discreet surveillance on the governor. He needed it for Hillary because she wanted to gauge exactly how vulnerable her husband would be to charges of philandering if he decided to launch a bid for the presidency. Jane claims that about a week before his death, Vince Foster telephoned her husband. Hillary was worried that there might be something in the files that could cause damage to Bill or herself. Jerry told Vince Foster that there was indeed plenty to hurt both of them. But you can't give her those files. That was the agreement. A few days later, Foster again called the Parks residence. He was calling from a payphone. He said he was going to meet Hillary at the flat, and he was going to give her the files. Parks then said, you can't give Hillary those files. She's capable of doing anything. Two days later, Vince Foster was dead. When he learned of Foster's death, Jerry Parks told his wife, I'm a dead man. For the next two months, he was in a state of fear. He would carry a pistol to fetch the mail. On his way to the office, he would double back or take strange routes. Two months later, on a Sunday afternoon, Jerry had dinner at El Chico Mexican Restaurant. On the way back, a car pulled up beside him and shot and killed him with a 9mm handgun at point-blank range. His home was broken into before he was murdered. The only thing taken from his home was the files he had on Clinton's activities. Trooper Ferguson's ex-wife, Kathy, was to be one of the key witnesses for the prosecution in the Paula Jones case and had been openly vocal about her belief in Paula's testimony. Four days after Paula Jones filed her lawsuit against Bill Clinton, Kathy Ferguson was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head. Her death was ruled a suicide. The following is an affidavit of Sherry Butler, who was one of Kathy's best friends. Quote, Kathy Ferguson had been a friend of mine from 1991 to 1994, and on occasion had mentioned that while attending functions at the governor's mansion, then Governor Bill Clinton had cornered her in the kitchen of the mansion and pinned her to the counter. Shortly before her death, Kathy stated that what Paula Corbin Jones was saying about Clinton was the truth and, quote, I wouldn't put anything past Bill Clinton, unquote. Kathy Ferguson had been a nurse and a number of medical personnel attended her open casket funeral. Her autopsy report had placed the fatal bullet's entrance wound at the right temple with the exit wound at the left temple, making it a possible suicide. However, at the funeral home, three nurses, an RN and two LPNs, decided to make a careful examination of the wound. Yet none of them saw any wound at the left temple. What they did see looked to be a large, blown-out exit wound in the right temple. This puzzled them, because they knew Ferguson was right-handed. This prompted them to look for an entrance wound on the left side. One of the nurses rolled the corpse's head to the side. All three nurses were then able to see a cotton-stuffed wound behind the left ear. Several other hospital colleagues subsequently visited the funeral home and made the same observation. The following is an affidavit of Samuel Houston, M.D. I have been contacted by six nurses who each described the head wounds of Kathy Ferguson at the open casket funeral and described a small, clean, quarter-size hole with cotton balls stuffed within it behind her left ear and a large, blown-out wound to the right temple, pulling the right eye over. None of the above nurses saw any wounds on the area of her left temple on careful examination of her head. So, according to the testimony of a doctor and six nurses, the bullet may have entered from behind the left ear and exited at the right temple, making Kathy Ferguson's death 
a possible homicide. Dr. Houston recalled his last conversation with Ferguson on the day before her death. She told him that she wished she did not know as much as she knew concerning the Arkansas State Troopers and their activities and those of Danny Ferguson. Bill Shelton was an Arkansas police officer and boyfriend of Kathy Ferguson. He had been publicly critical of the ruling that stated Kathy's death was a suicide. A month later, Shelton was also shot behind the ear, and his death was also ruled a suicide. In November 1993, Kathleen Willey was leaving the Oval Office from a private meeting with President Clinton when she ran into her friend, Linda Tripp. Willie told Tripp that Clinton kissed her and fondled her. Tripp described Willie as disheveled. Her face was red, her lipstick was off, and she was flustered. Kathleen's husband, Ed Willie, was manager of the Clinton Presidential Finance Committee. He was found shot to death a few hours after his wife's incident with Clinton. The death was ruled a suicide. Newsweek magazine had dropped hints that a former White House staffer was about to go public with her story of sexual harassment at the White House. A few days later, on July 6, 1997, Mary Catron Mahoney and two other employees at Starbucks coffee shop died of gunshot wounds. The restaurant's doors were locked when the victims were found, and nothing appeared to have been stolen, although nearly $4,000 was in the store at the time. Mary Mahoney was shot as many as five times. The Washington Post characterized the crime as an execution-style murder. She had been heavily involved in presidential politics, working on Bill Clinton's campaign in 1992, and served as a White House intern during the first Clinton administration. November 1997. A transmission shop owner opened the trunk of a tornado-ravaged car and found a trunk load of documents. Among them, a 1982 cashier's check for $27,000 payable to Bill Clinton. The source of the funds for the check was the McDougal Savings and Loan. The shop owner, Johnny Lawhon, was reluctant to talk about his discovery. He said, quote, Clinton is the most powerful man in the world, unquote. Lawhon later died in an automobile accident. James McDougall had stated, quote, Immediately concurrent with the check being found, I started getting a lot of heat. I am a prisoner of the executive branch, unquote. He was serving a three-year sentence in the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas, and was cooperating with the independent counsel into the investigation of the president. He was scheduled to testify before the grand jury. Against doctor's orders, McDougall was given an injection of Lasix, a diuretic. He was then put in solitary confinement where he died of cardiac arrest. Ron Brown was the target of a major probe headed by independent counsel Daniel Pearson. There were allegations that Brown had received a bribe from a Vietnamese businessman. He was also being investigated for numerous scandals by the FBI, the FDIC, a Congressional Oversight Committee, the Energy Department, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and even his own Commerce Department Inspector General. Brown's business partner, Nolanda Hill, would later testify in March 1998 that White House officials wanted him to cover up a scheme involving the sale of U.S. trade mission slots to executives in exchange for contributions for the upcoming Clinton-Gore presidential campaign and the Democratic Party. She said, Ron expressed to me his displeasure that the purpose of the commerce trade missions had been and were being perverted at the direction of the White House. On April 3, 1996, an Air Force Boeing 737 carrying Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 34 others on a trade mission to the Balkans crashed into a hillside near Croatia's Dubrovnik Airport. Air Force procedure called for a two-step investigation. 
However, for the first time in memory, the Air Force canceled the first step, which called for a safety investigation of a crash on friendly soil. An autopsy on Brown's body would typically have been part of this investigation. They instead went directly to the second and final step, consisting mostly of legal proceedings that would mirror the sentiments of the Pentagon and White House officials, who implied the crash was nothing more than an accident. The Croatian Wire Service reported that the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder had been recovered. Later, the Pentagon disputed this, saying that no voice recorder was on board. But Hillary Clinton flew on the very same aircraft two weeks prior, making it unlikely that a voice recorder would not have been on board. The Air Force concluded that Brown's plane was 10 degrees or almost two miles off course. Maintenance chief Niko Jersik was in charge of the ground beacons and was scheduled to be grilled by the U.S. Air Force accident investigation team. However, he was found shot to death three days following the crash. His death was ruled a suicide. Over three hours after the crash, the first search party arrived on the scene and miraculously found a survivor. Air Force Tech Sergeant Shelley Kelly was found alive and would have helped officials with their investigation into the crash. But she died of a broken neck on the way to a nearby hospital. Lieutenant Steve Cogswell, a forensic pathologist who investigated the crash, contends there is evidence that Ron Brown might have been murdered. He said, quote, Essentially, Brown had a 45 hundredths inch inwardly beveling circular hole in the top of his head, which is essentially the description of a 45 caliber gunshot wound. This man needs an autopsy. This whole thing stinks, unquote. Several personnel were present while Colonel Gormley was conducting his external examination. The photographer present was Chief Petty Officer Kathleen Janoski, a 22-year veteran. I opened up my big mouth in the morgue and said, wow, look at the hole in Ron Brown's head. It looks like a bullet hole. I said that, and my life has never been the same since. All of the x-ray films of Brown's head have disappeared. There were allegedly many photos taken of Brown that were stored in a safe, but these photos along with the negatives have also disappeared. All that remains of the head x-rays are photographic slide images taken by Janowski. Dr. Cyril Wecht has nearly 40 years of experience, has conducted some 13,000 autopsies, and is considered one of the nation's most prominent forensic pathologists. He is also prominent in Democratic Party politics. He says there was more than enough evidence to suggest a possible homicide in the death of Ron Brown, and an autopsy should have been conducted on his body. As he stated, quote, it's not even arguable in the field of medical legal investigations whether an autopsy should have been conducted on Ron Brown, unquote. And Lieutenant Colonel Cogswell stated, quote, you can't ignore who this person is. To stack up the coincidences, one of 35 people has got a hole in their head. The hole is dead center in the top of their head. And it just happens to be the most important person on the plane from a political point of view. That's a whole lot of reason to investigate it, unquote. In late 1993, the White House Office of Personal Security, headed by Craig Livingstone, illegally obtained from the FBI the confidential background files on more than 900 Bush administration officials and other perceived enemies of President Clinton. At the request of Hillary Clinton, the files were to be uploaded onto White House computers so that sensitive information could be shared with the Democratic National Committee. These files contain all allegations, rumors, or statements made about the individual during FBI background checks, whether or not confirmed, true, or even credible. Livingstone had a history of prior drug use which should have disqualified him from serving in the White House. However, senior White House counsel William Kennedy III said that Livingstone was hired on orders from the First Lady. Other evidence indicates that this illegal activity was likely approved by President Clinton. Congressman Bob Barr comments on this frightening scenario. Chuck Colson, uh, who is now uh, a born-again Christian, 
uh, and a prominent speaker on prison reform and, and uh, religion in America, uh, went to federal prison, went to jail, uh, because he misused a single uh, government law enforcement file. Yet we now have, we now know that the Clinton administration uh, misused uh, perhaps upwards of a thousand or more uh, FBI files, uh, which include and contain very sensitive information on average American citizens. I think clearly uh, what the Clinton administration is trying to do is an orchestrated systematic effort to thwart justice, to thwart the rule of law, to thwart legitimate investigations by the Congress, whether it's impeachment proceedings or regular oversight. Uh, they're clearly uh, designed as they are with going after Kenneth Starr, the independent counsel, and other independent counsels trying to uh, derail investigations. They're trying to derail prosecutions. It is very well orchestrated, and I'm sorry to say, in some degree, it is uh, succeeding. But these are not isolated incidents that we're seeing with the compilation of enemies lists, enemies files, FBI files. It is systematic. It is abusive. I believe it is illegal. And it is very frightening because this is precisely the sort of stuff, except on a much larger scale, that forced President Nixon from office uh, a generation ago. Who was the biggest contributor to the Clinton-Gore ticket in 1992? Not a corporation, not a labor union, not a Hollywood mogul, but Indonesian businessman James Riyadi, who gave $450,000 to elect Bill Clinton. The Riyadis and their executives gave an additional $600,000 to the Democratic National Committee and Democratic State Parties. The Riyadis' corporate flagship is the Lippo Group, a multi-billion dollar financial conglomerate with business ties to China's communist government. The patriarch of the business empire Mokhtar Riyadi and all three of his sons have fled the country. In 1977, Mokhtar Riyadi became partners in one of America's largest investment banks, Stevens Incorporated in Little Rock, Arkansas. His son, James Riyadi, interned there and soon began a friendship with Arkansas Attorney General Bill Clinton. Thus began a friendship that has lasted 20 years and has spread a web of intrigue, financial corruption, and foreign influence into American government. In return for their generosity, the Riyadis and their friends were given unparalleled access to the White House. On the afternoon of April 19, 1993, 80 members of the Branch Davidian religious cult were holed up in their compound outside Waco, Texas. On that same day, James Riyadi, John Huang, and other Chinese officials were visiting President Clinton in the Oval Office. The television in the corner showed CNN's live coverage of the burning compound as 17 American children were dying in a burning inferno. But the President took time out to give his visitors a tour of the White House. In their book, Year of the Rat, Edward Timberlake and William Triplett have connected the dots between the Clinton White House and the Communist Chinese. Some examples are as follows. The Riyadi family with connections to Communist China's KGB became the largest contributor to the Clinton-Gore campaign in 1992. Communist agents and representatives of Chinese organized crime were granted extraordinary access to the White House. They had targeted Bill Clinton 15 years earlier when he was an obscure politician in Arkansas. America's defense and foreign policy have been twisted to benefit Clinton and Gore foreign backers, including the Chinese military. Nearly 100 witnesses have either fled the country or taken the Fifth Amendment. William C. Triplett II is the former chief counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He has 30 years of experience working on China and national security. We asked him about the Riyadi family. They tried to come into the United States in the late 70s in Georgia. Uh, that didn't work out. Um, ultimately, they ended up in Little Rock. And in Little Rock in the late 70s, uh, the, the heir apparent to the family fortune met uh, Mr. Clinton when he was then Attorney General of Arkansas. And there have been perhaps 20 years worth of 
uh, friendship uh, from, from thence. Their man in the United States was a man named John Huang, who was also ethnic Chinese from Taiwan, and he joined them overseas. And he looked after their business interests here and also their campaign contributions. He was in charge of writing the checks and making sure that it happened. In 1992, uh, Mr. Clinton, in the spring, was in trouble. Uh, it had been discovered that he was a draft dodger. Uh, the Jennifer Flowers uh, business had come out, and he was out of money for uh, the New York primary. He, what happened then was that the Riotti family has a bank in Arkansas that they could influence, and they, the bank gave three and a, or loaned $3.5 million to the Clinton campaign. And that was enough to get him the nomination. So I think one could say that they were instrumental in getting him the nomination and the election uh, in 1992. It's really quite outrageous for a dollar that an American citizen provides to a candidate or a party of their choice uh, being neutralized by a dollar coming in a million times over uh, from a foreign source, not just a foreign source, but a foreign adversarial source, namely Communist China. The Riotti family is not a public charity. They wanted something for their money. So after Bill Clinton got elected, they sent a letter to Bruce Lindsay, who was in charge of personnel in the Clinton administration, saying that they had invested in Mr. Clinton. What they wanted was for their man, John Huang, to be moved into the American government, and they succeeded. In January 1994, Huang, who had been the area manager for Riotti's bank in Little Rock, received a top-secret security clearance for his new job at the Commerce Department. According to phone records, Huang made over 400 calls to various parts of the Riotti and Lippo Empire. 170 calls were to Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Red China. CIA agents have testified that they gave Huang 37 classified one-on-one -on -one briefings in his office at Commerce. They estimate that he could have seen as many as 550 pieces of American intelligence. Huang later went to work for the Democratic National Committee, where he would have normally lost his security clearance. But much pressure was put on Assistant Commerce Secretary Charles Meissner, and Huang was able to keep his security clearance. Charles Meissner later died in the same plane crash that killed Ron Brown. One official said, a lot of secrets died with Chuck Meisner. We now know that during the 1996 campaign, John Huang was actively seeking campaign funds for Bill Clinton from Asian sources, who have ties to organized criminal syndicates, narcotics trafficking, gambling, prostitution, and communist China's intelligence services. During this same period, he had access to highly classified information, Lieutenant Colonel Liu Chaoying is the daughter of General Liu Huiqing, China's premier PLA officer and an old revolutionary communist soldier. She also studied Marxism-Leninism at the Chinese People's University in Beijing, a major training center for the future Communist Party officials. Colonel Liu is a communist. She is a high-tech spy. She was an official of two red Chinese companies that deal in arms trafficking. She ran at least tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars through Johnny Chung into the Democratic National Committee, and she met Clinton twice at fundraisers. According to FBI Director Louis Free, Chinese criminal gangs called triads have emerged as a significant and violent force in the United States, committing contract murders, extortion, drug trafficking, kidnapping, prostitution, weapon smuggling, and money laundering. The triads have been guests of the Clinton White House many times and have made illegal contributions to the Clinton-Gore re-election campaign. Neg Lapseng is a Macau criminal syndicate figure who visited the White House on many occasions. He attended a number of fundraisers and even sat next to the president at some of them. Neg Lapseng and others are partners in Angdu International of Thailand, a firm that procures Thai women many of them underage, for prostitution. In May 1996, these men were honored guests at a Clinton fundraiser. 
Charlie Tree is another person from Taiwan. Uh, he grew up in a rough neighborhood uh, that is the breeding ground for a criminal element called triads. He came to the United States to work in the kitchen of his sister's um, Chinese restaurant in, uh, in Little Rock. Uh, became friends with uh, um, Mr. Clinton when he was a, an Arkansas official and so forth and so on. And when the president, when he became the president, he used that to uh, to exploit uh, his his business interests. He became uh, a friend of a man from Macau, and we think they both became connected uh, through Chinese gangster connections. And the man from Macau became his, in essence, his. Uh, sponsor and uh, sugar daddy, if you will. The man from Macau uh, is in the business of exploiting uh, women for prostitution. He owns a hotel in Macau that is a brothel, and with two other men, he owns a separate company that procures Thai women for prostitution in Macau. Charlie Tree had been in Little Rock since the late 1970s and had known the Clintons for almost as long. Thus, he was the perfect triad messenger and agent in place for the People's Republic of China, ready to be reactivated without suspicion. As the Canadian study of triad behavior points out, once a triad, always a triad. For the past 50 years, the United States has guaranteed Taiwan's independence against Communist China's threat of forcible reunification. In March 1996, Taiwan, or the Republic of China, was preparing for a national ritual that the People's Republic of China despises. The ritual is called elections. When Taiwan's elections proceeded on schedule, the People's Liberation Army launched several of its intermediate-range ballistic missiles by firing them into the Pacific just off the north and south ends of the island. Clinton then sent battle groups from the 7th Fleet, including its two largest aircraft carriers, the Independence and the Nimitz, into the Taiwan Straits. This time, Clinton did the right thing. After this incident, two things happened. First, a top Chinese official in Beijing intimated to the U.S. Embassy that an attack against Los Angeles would be in the prospects if the United States interfered in Communist China's campaign of intimidation against Taiwan. But the Red Chinese government also tried a second channel. They sent Charlie Tree carrying a letter and a bag of money. On the morning of March 21, 1996, Tree dropped off several hundred thousand dollars to the president and the first lady's favorite charity, the Presidential Legal Defense Trust. On the same day, Tree also delivered to the White House a letter about the situation in Taiwan. Excerpts from the letter are as follows. Once the hard parties of the Chinese military inclined to grasp U.S. involvement as foreign intervention, is U.S. ready to face such challenge? It is highly possible for China to launch real war. I hope the President will carefully consider these issues and make the decisions that are beneficial to the U.S., China, and Taiwan altogether. President Clinton's reply letter read, The redeployment of the independence and the Nimitz was intended as a signal to both Taiwan and the PRC that the United States was concerned about maintaining stability in the Taiwan Strait region. It was not intended as a threat to the PRC. This letter was a complete sellout of Taiwan. Clinton, in effect, was saying that his administration would no longer be prepared to deter Beijing from any menacing actions it may take toward Taiwan. Bill Clinton had caved in, in the face of pressure from Beijing, by a letter that was not delivered through public or diplomatic channels, but by a man whose previous experience was a member of a notorious triad gang, a fry cook from a Chinese restaurant in Little Rock who was under indictment for violating election laws.
On June 4, 1989, Chinese tanks and armored personnel carriers rolled into Tiananmen Square to confront pro-democracy students from four of Beijing's most prestigious universities. The students were unarmed and practitioners of non-violence. When it was over, some 4,000 to 6,000 people lay dead in the streets of Beijing. We know who did it. We know the names of the, of the uh, Chinese units. We know their commanding officers. We know everyone. And the reason we know is because NATO's uh, military attaches had spread all over, the, all over the city that night, and they were reporting from all points of the city, and we know who the, who, uh, the commanders of the Chinese units were and what they did that night. And they killed the Chinese young people, and they knew what they were doing, and they did it anyway. Congress reacted immediately, forcing President Bush to cut off all military exchanges with the PLA. This policy stood for the next four years. As soon as President Clinton was uh, elected, that policy was reversed. And so as near as we can tell, every Chinese general who was personally involved in killing Chinese young people has been to the United States and received the royal treatment. Now, typically, how this works is as follows. The Chinese general comes here in secret goes to the Pentagon, gets a 19-gun honor guard salute. He will go to the White House, meet with the president in the Oval Office for discussions. Then he will be taken to American military bases to learn things about the military that we think they should not, and then he goes home. And we're talking somewhere between a dozen and two dozen uh, generals. The Clinton administration has shown senior PLA officers our most modern military facilities shown PLA a marine amphibious landing exercise, shown them around our latest guided missile cruiser, given the PLA chief of staff a tour of our military command center in the Pacific, escorted the PLA chief of staff around an American nuclear attack submarine. General Shu was the, in tactical control uh, the night of the massacre, and he is the one who gave the order to the troops mount up and move out. He is the man who in fact was the closest we could point to to ordering uh, the massacre of the young people. On the day of the Tiananmen massacre, General Xu shoulders more responsibility for the deaths of his countrymen than any other Chinese officer. Under his orders, children as young as three years of age died from PLA gunfire. Upon his arrival at the Pentagon, General Xu received a 19-gun salute. Defense Secretary Perry told General Xu that his visit had great symbolic significance. Perry pledged to brief the PLA on U.S. strategy and plans for the years ahead. The American taxpayers paid $13,200 for General Xu and his party to have a four-day visit to Hawaii. The China Ocean Shipping Company, otherwise known as Costco, is a merchant marine that is essentially a naval arm of the People's Liberation Army. It is also a major arms supplier to dictators and to terrorists. In 1996, a Costco ship called the Empress Phoenix sailed into the port of Oakland, California, carrying 2,000 automatic weapons that were destined for Los Angeles street gangs. The chairman of one of the two Chinese arms companies implicated in this scheme later had coffee at the White House. The naval station in Long Beach, California closed in 1991, but it did not remain unoccupied. A Marine Reserve training center that had been destroyed by an earthquake was allowed space there. But Costco also wanted the naval station. So in November 1996, the White House placed a series of phone calls to Long Beach officials. The Clinton administration made it clear that leasing the port to Costco was their preference. In the end, the United States Marines lost their space. And Communist China's Costco, with the help of Bill Clinton, got what they had lobbied for. They got control of the naval station at Long Beach. Johnny Chung is a 
Taiwanese businessman, lives in, in uh, Southern California, uh, probably a little bit better than some of the rest of this crowd that shows up in this little drama, uh, we think, marginally better. Uh, he was trying to promote his business interests, and uh, he was pretty honest about uh, how he saw things. For example, he's famous for saying that the White House is just like a turnstile in a subway. You have to put coins in to pass the gate. And he put a lot of coins in, something in the order of several hundred thousands of dollars. In fact, he dropped a $50,000 check on the First Lady's uh, Chief of Staff one time when he was visiting. Uh, depending on what records you used, he went in and out of the White House 50 to 60 times, something like that. And the question then is, where did the money come from that he was donating to the Democratic National Committee? And we believe that a lot of the money he was donating uh, came from Chinese military intelligence sources. Johnny Chung went to Hillary Clinton with a number of requests for Chinese officials. A meeting with President Clinton. A tour of the White House. Lunch at the White House. A photo opportunity with the First Lady an invitation to attend the president's radio address. Every request was granted. And on March 11, 1995, Johnny Chung with his communist Chinese friends attended President Clinton's weekly radio address. It all fell into place after Chung handed a check for $50,000 made out to the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, to Hillary's chief of staff, Maggie Williams, following a March 9th photo opportunity with the First Lady. Two photographs in particular speak volumes about the deals this White House has cut. The first shows President Clinton and the First Lady with Macau criminal syndicate figure Nek Lap Seng. The second photo was taken at the Sai Lai Buddhist Temple and shows Vice President Gore with Ted Sioing. It's important to recall that both men are in the business of exploiting Asian women for prostitution. Many of these women are underage and are sold into slavery by their poverty-stricken families. Often they are encouraged to develop narcotic habits in order to keep them dependent. Who would have guessed that Bill Clinton and Al Gore would literally sit down to dinner with these men in exchange for millions of dollars in illegal donations? much of the money coming from their prostitution rings. The evidence clearly establishes that important technology, missile technology, uh, computer technology, and probably in the near future nuclear technology has been and will be made available to the government of communist China. Uh, this will have, I believe, and already has begun to have very serious devastating consequences for us and perhaps some of our allies. For example, uh, the communist Chinese long march rocket, which never marched very long because it, it kept blowing up. Uh, their decoupling systems were, in, were inadequate. Their guidance systems were inadequate. So they did not pose as serious a threat as they otherwise would to the United States of America. Now, as a result of decisions by the Clinton administration to relax export controls and based on actions by certain U.S. companies who put the almighty dollar ahead of our national security and the national security of this country and our citizens, communist China now has been able to remedy the problems with their long-range long rockets, those that would be targeted at the United States or that are used to launch satellites into orbit. They now have been able to solve the decoupling problems and the guidance problems, so they pose, one, a direct danger to this country because we have enhanced the capability of the communist Chinese government to launch successfully missiles at the United States and to place into orbit spy satellites. Moreover, that technology is now, we already know, finding its way to third countries that are adversarial to us as well, such as Iran. Thirdly, from a commercial standpoint, by virtue of our enhancing the ability of the communist Chinese to develop more successful and reliable launch vehicles, we're undercutting our own aerospace industry. So we're hurting ourselves not only from a national security standpoint, but from a commercial standpoint as well. Uh, and uh, 
this, this poses a direct threat to the national security of the United States of America and our allies. The following are a few of the many casualties of those having knowledge or involvement in one or more of the Clinton scandals. In order to save time, only a partial list is shown. July 1978, Susan Coleman allegedly became pregnant after having an affair with Clinton, a problem which threatened to disrupt Clinton's election bid. She committed suicide by shooting herself in the back of the head. August 1991. Danny Casaloro was a reporter who investigated various scandals in Arkansas, including Clinton's Arkansas Development and Finance Authority and MENA. He had warned his family that his life was in danger, and if he were found dead of an apparent accident or suicide, not to believe it. Casaloro was found dead in a bathtub in a West Virginia hotel room with his wrist slit. His death was ruled a suicide. July 1992. C. Victor Racer II was a national finance co-chairman of Clinton's presidential campaign, who died in a plane crash near Anchorage, Alaska. With his inside knowledge of the Clinton administration, he allegedly had become disillusioned by what he had seen, and thus became a potential liability. His son, Montgomery, also died in the same crash. Herschel Friday was a member of Victor Racer's campaign finance committee. Although he was a top-notch pilot, he died a year and a half later when his plane crashed and exploded as it approached the runway. His death was ruled an accident. September 1992, Paul Tully, Democratic National Committee political director, was a friend and trusted advisor of Clinton's. He was found dead due to unknown causes in his hotel room. December 1992, Paula Gober, was a speech interpreter and had traveled with Clinton extensively from 1978 until her death. She died in a car accident. December 1992, Jim Wilhite was an associate of Mac McClarty's former firm. He had called McClarty just hours before dying in a skiing accident. January 1993, Ed Cawley, a former Clinton campaign finance chairman in Arkansas, was found dead in a hotel room. May 1993, John Wilson, a Washington, D.C. city councilman, had decided to come forward with inside knowledge he possessed regarding Whitewater. Wilson was found hanged. His death was ruled a suicide. June 1993, Paul Wilcher, a Washington, D.C. attorney, wrote a 105-page letter to Attorney General Janet Reno describing evidence he had concerning drug and gun running out of Mena, Arkansas. On the first page of his letter, he stated, quote, The lives of key participants, other witnesses, and even myself, are now in grave danger as a result of my passing this information on to you. If you let this information fall into the hands of the wrong persons, some or all of those who know the truth could well be silenced in the very near future, unquote. Wiltshire was found dead in his apartment. The coroner did not rule on the cause of death. August 1993, John Walker was a senior investigator for the Resolution Trust Corporation. He was looking for information concerning a $50 million transfer from an RTC fund in Chicago to Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan to cover up a $47 million embezzlement scheme that included Whitewater and the Clintons. Walker mysteriously fell to his death from an apartment balcony. His death was ruled a suicide. September 1993, Dr. Stanley Hurd was a longtime friend and family physician of the Clintons and was chairman of Hillary's Health Reform Committee. He was killed in a plane crash only a few days after Stephen Dixon, the attorney for the Health Reform Committee, had been killed in the crash of his own light plane. March 1994, Dr. Donald Rogers, the Clintons' dentist, was traveling to meet London Sunday Telegraph reporter Ambrose Evans Pritchard with information on the Clinton scandal. Rogers and his pilot were killed when their twin-engine Cessna crashed in clear weather near Lawton, Oklahoma. Their deaths were ruled an accident. May 1994, Gandhi Baugh, Dan Lassiter's attorney, committed suicide by jumping out of the window of a tall building. His partner committed suicide one month later. June 1994, 
Stanley Huggins was a partner in a Memphis law firm who investigated the dealings of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. He produced a 300-page report that has never been made public. Huggins was found dead, reportedly of viral pneumonia. July 1994, Calvin Walraven was a 24-year-old police informant. He testified for the prosecution against Kevin Elders, son of Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders, which resulted in the conviction of Mr. Elders for drug trafficking. A few days later after the trial, Mr. Walraven was found with a gunshot wound to the head. His death was ruled a suicide. October 1994, Florence Martin was an accountant who allegedly had documents as well as the PIN number to an account that had been set up in the name of Barry Seal for $1.46 million at the Fuji Bank in the Cayman Islands. Martin was found dead of three gunshot wounds to the head. November 1996, Barbara Wise was a Commerce Department staffer. She was found dead in her locked office at the Department of Commerce, partially nude and covered with bruises. In their scramble to secure and maintain power, Bill Clinton and Al Gore have left a legacy of corruption, making unscrupulous bargains for campaign cash, selling out our national security, losing our nation's technical edge, catering to red Chinese agents, arms smugglers, and gangsters, and enabling the People's Republic of China intelligence to penetrate our political and defense establishments. The damage they have done is deep, but there is perhaps a treatment for this cancer that has befallen this nation. Wall Street Journal contributing editor Mark Halpern described President Clinton as, quote, the most corrupt, fraudulent, and dishonest president we have ever known, unquote. His remedy? One word will do justice. One word. Impeach. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. The United States Constitution, Article 2, Section 4, lists the following as impeachable offenses. Treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Therefore, on December 19, 1998, the United States House of Representatives voted on Articles of Impeachment against William Jefferson Clinton. He was found guilty of providing perjurious, false, and misleading testimony to the grand jury. And he prevented, obstructed, and impeded the administration of justice. Secretary, by direction of the House of Representatives, and pursuant to House Resolution 614, I hereby deliver these articles of impeachment. Would you hold us? Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment while the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States articles of impeachment against William Jefferson Clinton, President of the United States. William Jefferson Clinton, by such conduct, warrants impeachment and trial and removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Bill Clinton has become just the second president in U.S. history to be impeached. The evidence is overwhelming that Mr. Clinton has committed serious crimes against the people and government of the United States. Crimes such as accepting bribes from such shady figures as the Red Chinese military, organized crime kingpins, and internationally wanted thieves in exchange for U.S. governmental support for their schemes. Obstructing justice by withholding key evidence, encouraging others to lie under oath, and arranging for others to receive payoffs in exchange for their silence. 
aiding foreign powers considered to be enemies of the United States by giving them access to top secret information, restricted military armaments, and a safe haven on U.S. soil, all in exchange for large campaign contributions.